yeah, there will be, uh, Megan will uh, briefly introduce uh, Margaret and then the floor is yours, Margaret. Thank you so much for being with us today. I have to go ahead. Excellent. Yes. Hi everyone. Welcome to this latest session of the uh, of the prosthetic embodiment and cognition in classical antiquity and beyond seminar series. Um, I'm honored to be chairing tonight's session. Uh, my name is Megan Debrain Molay, um, University of Southampton, UK, uh, and I'm also a founding member of the Critical Posthumanism Network, which is kind of why I'm here today. I've done work with some with some of the people in this room. But more importantly, I'm also very honored to be introducing Professor Margaret Schildrick, um, whose work has been extremely influential to my own writing, and I'm sure to many of yours as well. Um, and Professor Schildrick, you know, manages to be a fantastic human being um, in addition to um, many other achievements. Margaret <laughs> Schildrick is a guest professor of gender and knowledge production at Stockholm University, an adjunct professor of critical disability studies at York University, Toronto. Her research covers postmodern feminist and cultural theory, bioethics, critical disability studies, and body theory. Books include Leaky Bodies and Boundaries, Feminism, Bioethics, and Postmodernism, 1997, Embodying the Monster, Encounters with the Vulnerable Self, from 2002, and Dangerous Discourses of Disability, Sexuality, and Subjectivity, from 2009. And she's currently addressing the embodied conjunction of microchimerism, immunology, and corporeal anomaly, and writing a new book um, entitled Visceral Prostheses, Biotechnologies, and Posthuman Embodiment, forthcoming with Bloomsbury Press, which I'm sure we're all looking forward to. Um, we hope to have time for questions following the talk, but obviously feel free to post your comments and questions in the chat throughout the session, because we will be keeping an eye on that. And otherwise there will be time for you to use the raise hand button or unmute yourself and uh, ask questions after the talk. So without further ado, Margaret Sheldrick discussing um, feeling technology, empathy, robots for therapeutic use. Okay, thank you very much, Megan. Um, that was a very good summary. Um, the, the, the paper I'm, giving today, the presentation I'm giving today is, is part of the new book that Megan mentioned, so um, Visceral Prostheses. I mean, it's a very pared down version because we only have half an hour. Um, but nonetheless, I, I, I think you'll get some idea of where we're going. Okay, so I'm going to use a PowerPoint, which hopefully will, yes, here we are, good. So, the question here is how to address the cognitively and physically anomalous states of transformation that occur throughout the life course. And that's something that's um, seen a move in disability studies away from a medical model that um, seeks treatment for some kind of putative pathology to focus instead on the phenomenology and affect of differential forms of embodiment without resorting to hierarchies of value. Now, research on aging tends to be more conventional. Um, my own approach to dementia explores how that category of supposedly failing health and the practices that emerge in institutional care are queered by intervention of technological prostheses. And what's widely in play with regard to the failures and failures in air quotes of aging bodies is a deficit model that implies that those affected are especially vulnerable and have a shaky hold of what counts as fully human. But is the ideology of successful aging that seeks to preserve or reinvigorate a sense of selfhood in people with dementia, the most coherent response? So in this presentation, we're gonna think about dementia, not as an exceptional state marked by the loss of independence, but in terms of the prosthetic nature of all embodiments. The claim that our bodies are entangled with an array of external and internal prosthetic devices is widely accepted. And those technological aids may become components, albeit temporary ones, of the assemblage, which is then identified as the person. So 
Um, let's first look at the normative context of dementia. In the conventional terms of the global north, the putative declines associated with the embodiment of dementia signify a personal status of irreversible cognitive degeneration and a breakdown in normative communicative competence that re uh, results in an increasing inability to maintain the functions of everyday living. In recent years, however, there's been an upsurge in potential biotechnological interventions in the form of prostheses that claim to offer to those with dementia some tools for maintaining contact with their previous sense of self. Now, some of these are purely mechanical aids, such as robotic carers or quasi-animal companions, as well as animal-assisted interventions and the potential of brain implants to support deep brain stimulation. Um, in the longer version of this, I would also deal with microhumorism, but I'm not going to put that in today. Now, all of this happens, broadly speaking, under the auspices of modernist biomedicine, which is a subset of the sociocultural imaginary, is wedded to the idea of a singular self, defined ideally by the qualities of autonomy and rationality, even in the face of the multiple breakdown of those concepts in infancy, ill health, disability, and dementia. In 2020, the WHO estimated that around 50 million people worldwide have dementia, um, but it isn't a universal category. The experience is always socioculturally inflected. So in many traditional East Asian societies where um, family relations matter more than individuals, dementia is typically seen as a normal part of aging. In contrast to Westernized societies where the high regard for self-sufficiency and independence and the fear of specifically cognitive decline mark it as a condition of gross disruption in need of therapeutic interventions. So in the global north where dem dementia is something to fix or at least manage and prosthetic devices seem to offer some hope, but prostheses always raise questions about the nature of individual selfhood the very thing that they are supposed to enhance. So let's look at some recent developments in technological fixes and theorize the significance of those enhancements, which will arrive us at a Deleuzean notion of assemblages. Okay, so the use of quasi-animate digital or mechanical aids has been at the forefront of dementia care for many years now and is expected to provide benefits not only to those with dementia, but also to their families and professional carers. There are four categories of robots that can be deployed in dementia care. So there are rehabilitation robots, service robots, telepresence robots, and companion robots. And I'm going to focus on companion robots, whose primary purpose is to have a positive impact on the ability to sustain social relationships. Now, there are many ethical considerations about the possible dangers of replacing human with mechanized or digital care. But for robotic engineers, care robots are widely seen as a pragmatic technology that is intended to supplement, not supersede the interhuman aspect of the caring situation. So at root, much of the anxiety concerns the supposed insult to autonomous agency. But clearly for anyone with a neurocognitive condition, the question of autonomy as such has already diminished validity. What takes place, sorry, what takes its place is the injunction to respect it, the dignity and intrinsic value of every human being, whatever their physical or cognitive status. Now that's a necessary layer of protection against discrimination and abuse but there are good reasons to underline its limitations. It's not just that the approach fails to secure the interests of those it seeks to protect, but that it is grounded in an extremely limited liberal humanist understanding of what constitutes worthwhile life. The very concept of rights, dignity, interests, and so on are deeply normative and inherently reference the standard in which the human being is indeed autonomous, distinct from its others, and capable of rational thought. 
Now, the philosophical critique of that standard is now very long standing, but has yet to filter through to the practicalities of dementia care. Yet, even when dementia care is delivered conventionally through human to human interaction, the inevitable dependency of the one with dementia already problematizes her agentic singularity. With robots, the imbalance is even clearer. Now, as though such developments are far from unusual in the duration of a lifespan, after all, we're all dependent infants, we get ill or we get disabled, they remain a matter of concern to conventional notions of the self. Now, in contrast, feminist philosophy has been insistent that the relationality should trump autonomy. But advanced dementia rarely favours a two-way exchange. And for the most part, the feminist approach speaks to a normative model of interaction between two or more human beings. But what contemporary technologies demand is a reappraisal, not just of the interface of the human self and other, but of the boundaries between the human and the non-human. Sorry, Margaret, sorry to interrupt you. Um, you're still at your first slide. Is that it? Yeah, no? I am. Okay, <laughs> all right. I am. <laughs> Don't worry. Sorry. <laughs> so in short, um, any prosthetic device that augments functionality poses a challenge to the sovereign self of the Western Logos, especially when it appears to be a living entity in its own right. So my focus here is on emotional care or empathy robots, which are designed precisely to enter into not just practical but effective relationships with their users. Their agency in the conventional sense may be an illusion, but they do generate very real responses and affects, both emotional and somatic. And that alone unsettles and queers the confines of the human. Now there are many types in use and most researchers agree that having a human-like appearance, at least, up until the uncanny valley effect, which I'm sure you all know about, enhances acceptance and efficacy. Now, you'll see the unquestioned assumption of anthropocentric superiority is very clear, but my own examples of robotic technologies focus on both humanoid and non-humanoid models, though all intend the fantasy of live interaction. So, Paro, is a small fur covered robot resembling a baby uh, harp seal. It's about the size of a human infant. It can squeak and coo with pleasure, cry with discomfort, flap its flippers, open and close its eyes, react to sound and touch and appear to sleep. Now its varied responses give a strong sense of a living emotional being, albeit an infant one, capable of happiness, distress and surprise largely in reaction to the touch or the voice of the human user. Now, the point of Paro in dementia care is to stimulate the cognitive attention of users and to create a sense of interaction that can counter problems of isolation, aggression, and depression that affect many residents of care facilities. The intimate encounter with Paro, which mostly takes the form of cuddling or stroking, um, is, is a very common one, and you see many pictures like this. It's intended to be therapeutic, not just in calming and pleasing the user, but in setting up a sense in which the seal itself appears to be a vulnerable being in need of care, thus provoking a response and a sense of agency in the person with dementia. Now, Paro is technologically sophisticated and relatively expensive. It's about $6,000 for each unit. And it's in use many countries worldwide, and it's currently estimated to be used in 80% of Danish care residents. Now, several small scale studies have pointed to the benefits of Paro, not as an interaction between human and non-human that challenges effective boundaries, but as a utilitarian prop in which success is measured in terms of how far users improve their abilities to engage in social relationships, whether physical, verbal, or visual with other human beings in care settings. So in a typically human understanding of what counts, 
Sherry Turkle, for example, who um, some of you may remember was once an enthusiastic pioneer of digital technologies, is now dismayed by the lack of authenticity in what she calls empathy machines. And she doubts whether Paro offers anything more than the illusion of connectedness. As she explains, we ask technology to perform what used to be love's labor, taking care of each other. And she goes on to speculate that sharing uh, feelings with animate robots accustoms the user to a reduced range of emotions tied to those that the machine itself can simulate. Now, as well as the issue that Turkle, like many others, is unquestioning in privileging human to human interaction over human robot interaction, the heart of her ethically based distaste is the belief that, and I'm quoting, there is no symmetry between human beings and even the most advanced robots. Now, you can't disagree, but I wonder about the implicit assumption that interaction should be symmetrical. In any life, that might be the exception rather than the rule. And in the specific case of people with moderate or advanced dementia, who constitute the greatest proportion of care home residents, it's difficult to see how any relationship could be symmetrical. So can the encounter be thought in terms of a different kind of mutuality? So I want to consider a large scale research project into the effects of using parity. It was conducted in several Australian care facilities, whereas the authors state over 50% of all residents with dementia are reported to have negative behaviors, such as physical aggression, agitation, vocal disruption, and chronic mood disturbance. Now these challenging symptoms inevitably lead to additional stress in care staff and reduced empathy with the causal condition, which is in turn reflected back in the frustration and agitation of residents, which may lead to the additional regular use of antipsychotic medication. So the hope is that the use of parole will counter disruptive effects and lessen the need for pharmaceutical interventions. The project's introduction of PARO into the lives of care home residents for a period of 10 weeks was intended to test whether an animate robot was more sustainably therapeutic than either an equally cuddly but inanimate and therefore more affordable plush toy, which was actually PARO with all its um, functions disabled, or a program of usual, usual therapeutic care. The outcomes unsurprisingly were mixed but members of the PARO group were shown to be considerably more engaged with the object on a visual level, somewhat more engaged on a verbal level, and overall experienced greater pleasure and exhibited less agitation. There was initially a strong novelty effect for individual users of both PARO and plush toy, but pleasure in particular remained significantly higher after five weeks with the PARO group. The supposedly counter observation that PARO users also displayed increases in levels of anger was related to interruptions in activities, to other residents interfering with the robot toy, and finally to the removal of PARO after the allocated play period. Um, you can imagine the woman in, in this particular slide being very cross if her companion reached over and tried to take PARO from her. Now, Although PARO is originally intended to facilitate group interaction, what the project enabled was prolonged individual engagement with the robot. That there were few sustainable effects at a 15 week follow up, that's five weeks after it being removed, is surely to have been expected. While researchers are clear that the intervention provided alternative models of communication to the usual care interactions, their hope was that the improvements would readily translate to human-human encounters. In failing to see that human machine sensory interactions are valuable in their own right as exchanges that queer the limits of limited human behavior, the withdrawal of PARO surely constitutes a serious ethical misstep. The engagement and pleasure that PARO and to a certain extent plush toy evoked in residents was simply treated as a means to a definitive and human-centered end rather 
than as a demonstration of the restrictions of an anthropocentric outlook. The question raised is whether the companionship and comfort afforded by a real animal is equally devalued. The use of non-technological assistance animals, and they're usually dogs in disability contexts, is no less prosthetic than empathy robots and has found great favour both as emotional support and in helping with everyday tasks. Several studies outline the benefits of deploying visiting dogs in care homes, but the problems of hygiene and effective management usually preclude resident animals. A small Danish project established that the presence of any animal, in addition to a person, is more stimulating than a person alone. Mm -hmm and that robot animals are almost as effective as real ones. The finding that the dog and the robot seal triggered substantially more physical contact, verbal communication and eye contact compared to the inanimate toy cat suggests that the ability of the animal or the object to interact and give feedback affects the response. So are then robotic animals that of course require technical maintenance, but no daily burden of grooming, exercise, feeding or disposal of excretia, the way forward. A scoping review of 15 similar studies confirms the Danish experience and points to several positive outcomes for animal assisted interventions using both real dogs and a plethora of robotic animals, including Paro, Nakoro Cat and Justo Cat. In the majority of the research projects, significant improvements in behavioural and psychological symptoms, depression and mood and quality of life are recorded. Yet virtually nothing is said of the tactile dimensions of the encounter. Now, it's important to remember that residents with either moderate or severe dementia may become non-verbal, while touch remains relatively unimpaired. So given that there's wide acceptance that human to human tactile care benefits those with dementia, why is the haptic relation between those people and cuddlesome aids not given more value? There are good reasons to rethink what touch entails and to speculate on which encounters promote the well-being of people with dementia. Now, bioscientifically, touch is thought of as a multisensorial as multisensorial and it's closely connected to bodily awareness. Phenomenologically, it is quintessentially an interactive sensation in which the moment of touching is individual, in, indivisible from being touched. So touch crosses the boundaries of the proper rather than creating distance. It's precisely where the ontological separation and the hierarchical structure of self and other human and animal animal and machine, living and non-living might be overcome. And its importance for people with dementia is undeniable. As the Danish study notes of real animals, quote, the residents with severe cognitive impairment were more likely to touch the animal than those with mild impairment. But how do robotic animals fit into that sentiment? Now, can we think touch as queering and pulling together what are usually irreducible and hierarchical categories to create a novel kind of non-living assemblage that reconfigures the meaning of the human itself? So with that in mind, I'm going to turn to an animate humanoid robot. Papero is a small, but fairly heavy and bulky faced human face, sorry, bulky faced human like robot which has been widely used in aging care facilities in an effort to improve quality of life. Now, Papero is decidedly not cuddly, it has many tactile centers that enable it to converse, to respond appropriately to friendly or aggressive touching, to move around, recognize individual users and engage in simple games, singing and dancing. Like Paro, it's deployed to provide sensory stimulation, entertainment, and encouragement to social engage engagement with carers, family members, and peer groups. Now, most likely, Papero does deliver therapeutic benefit to some of those with dementia, but as a living model, it's far less convincing than Paro, even in the normative aim of enhancing strictly human interactions. 
Nonetheless, one major study asserts that Papero models used, and they are sweetly named Sophie and Jack, um, to get your gender balance right, are superior to pet-like robots because, and this is a quote, although the latter can provide entertainment and company similar to a pet for older people, the interaction of people with dementia with these robots is lacking. So once again, we're alerted to the limits assigned to what is effective interaction. The interaction and care displayed towards Paro and related prostheses like the much simpler Haribo's Joy for All cat and the calming of agitation that several studies, studies have shown do not count unless social engagement between the social robots and people with, dis with dementia can eventually facilitate human-to-human -human interaction in dementia care facilities. For all the hype, Papero is rigid, slow to move or respond, and if it's intended to mimic human behaviour, entirely unconvincing. I'd be slightly alarmed if my companions were to randomly break into song and dance as Papero does. Either the conditions of dementia genuinely infantilise, or that's the only way that those who provide care can make sense of the changed affects and capacities. Now that depressing result to normative categories is fully exemplified in the study observation that everybody likes to play bingo with Jack and Sophie is able to make people smile and laugh as well as causing them to be open to talk and to interact with robots and or people around them. In being programmed for verbal interaction, Papero and competing robots like Pepper are expected to stimulate group activities like playing games or leading exercise routines. The scope for individual face-to-face -face encounters is limited because their algorithmic articulations of encouragement rely on the fading hearing and language capacities of residents rather than the more universal response of touch. Some humanoid uh, robots, like Pepper, have an inbuilt touch screen, um, but it's an interface that's purely mechanical and unlikely to arouse positive affects in and of itself. So once again, the, the use of therapeutic revo robots revolves around a Western and modernist understanding of what constitutes the self, rather than considering the needs of the embodied self as at very least relationally constructed within the complex environment of humans, non-humans, inanimate objects, biomedical context, and so on. The emphasis remains on meeting clinical and institutional needs, not on what those with dementia might actually prefer. Now, whether the robotic prostheses are animate or inanimate, humanoid or animal, issues of their cultural sensitivity also raise questions about the Western-based assumptions behind their design and use. A new multidisciplinary and international project is currently underway to address precisely that shortcoming. So caresses, um, culturally aware robots and environmental sensor systems for elderly support, um, designs care robots that adapt to behavioural and um, speech um, idioms of the culture of those with whom they interact. And this is taken from their website about their aims. Now, clearly, this does constitute an important expansion of the terrain, though how far it will address different expressions of affect remains to be seen. The dimensions of the problem are neatly outlined by Cato's review of the deployment of PARO in different geocultural um, locations. It's not simply that there might be different attitudes towards robots, but that this specific cultural relationship between humans and pets influences whether animal robots are experienced as therapeutic. The lower status of pets, um, even though they're very popular in Asia, mitigates against trusting in the robot as a therapeutic device. And we should be aware too that certain people fear animals and that in many cultures and classes, 
Dogs and cats, and probably seals, have little acceptance as pets and may be seen as unclean. A further culture-based complication develops on the relationship of the modernist understanding of the self. So in contrast to that, the use of empathy robots in Japanese dementia care is seen as an opportunity to reconfigure the value of relationality within a new environment, drawing on um, human, animal and machine, in which selfhood continues in this contextual relation to have meaning. Each element emerges only in relation to the other rather than being given meaning by a central self. And as Tanaka points out, selfhood may not be expressed in a verbal manner, but through embodied interactions and nonverbal signals. Effectively, robots are as significant as any other constituents, including the human person. Now, the problem here is not that therapeutic therapeutic robot prostheses fail to deliver um, beneficial psychological, physiological and social effects, but that they are being assessed against distinctly humanist and Western standards. Robotic technologies at any level disturb notions of human individuality. But remember that dementia itself signals changes to the sense of self that are already destabilizing within normative contexts. Rather than focusing on efforts to revive the self or restore the self, we should open up to potential um, positive perspectives that such transformations can provide and begin to deprivilege the human. Could dementia, the state of literally being out of mind, signal some constructive possibilities, as Floyd Scoot suggests? He says, forced out of the mind, forced away from my customary cerebral mode of encounter, I find myself dwelling in wilder realms of sense and emotion. The range of animate empathy robots indicates that human interaction is not the limit of what might constitute living well. As Amelia DeFalco and Nick Jenkins, among too few others, have recognized, robot care prostheses pose a fundamental challenge to human exceptionalism. The technology that drives robots is already an ir irreducible facet of our post-human world, and it demands a post-humanist ontology and ethics. As Jenkin comments, it will require significant changes in the underlying ways in which we think about personhood and neurocognitive disease. Now, technological advances alone can never settle the problematic of dementia, but they do suggest that the continuing focus on the modernist ideals of explicitly human personhood will stultify the amelioration by robotic prostheses of the lived experience of confusion and isolation. At the simplest level, our faith in the stability of being gives way to the transmutations of becoming, always in the context of multiple others. What we know and how we should act depends on our immersion in an expansive field of interconnections that yield no universal principles. Now, critical dementia scholarship has begun to turn increasingly to such posthumanist accounts that contest the category of the human itself. Robotic forms are just one instance of the breakdown of normative boundaries. As Defunker writes, animal robots raise the spectre of queer, destabilizing intimacies that cast doubt on the very condition of the human. Now, to finish, I'll offer a brief theoretical expansion of the significance of our human entanglement with prosthetic others. Where success in conventional dementia devolves on how far an originary self can be protected or recovered, my question is whether we can reconceptualize the embodied self as part of a dynamic, a dynamic but not necessarily organic system of interdependency that never takes an atomistic form. What follows if we reject the distinction between a singular bounded body and its augmented form? What does it signify if the materiality of our own bodies is inherently and irreducibly multiple? And it's here that a turn to Deleuze is effective. His philosophy both breaks with the sovereign subject of modernity who exercises freedom, choice and rationality, and recognizes the individual experience of pain, suffering, and dissolution. In place of being, 
Deleuze proposes a state of becoming, a process of unraveling in which the vulnerability of any subject position is clear to see. The process is neither good nor bad, simply a continue, continual transformation. Every one of us is entangled in what Deleuze calls assemblages, those multiple and shifting webs of interconnections, both organic and inorganic, that constitute life itself. In taking account of multiple heterogeneous orders, Deleuzean thought is concerned with an irreducible hybridity of form and with the effects of mutual interactions. Normative elements continue to play a part, but they no longer occupy a hierarchical position of dominance, such as autonomy being more valuable than dependency. Instead of a pre-existing self determining the nature of possible connections, in an assemblage, it is the interconnections themselves that generate meaning. Deleuzean theory signals that when a body is produced as debilitated as in dementia, it does not stand alone, nor need its productivity cease. The medical humanities have only recently begun to appreciate the Deleuzean style, but assemblages are highly significant in enabling us to think differently about embodiment in ways that reclaim devalued forms. Functional efficacy is no longer at stake nor the expectation of a singular life prolonged. In contradistinction to modernist societies that regulate appropriate embodiment, the Deleuzean approach advocates pushing to the limits of what is possible, embracing uncertainty and radical change and sustained becoming, however that plays out. On a theoretical level, this is precisely how we should think of dementia. In other words, we should think a network of relations that dispense with the closed boundaries of the conventional life course and reimagine prostheses as constituting an assemblage that offers an alternative to individual and fully human selfhood. Rather than fearing dissolution of the embodied self, an affirmative biopolitics rethinks robotic technologies as entailing an opportunity to actively enter into modes of relations with multiple others. In the standard context of dementia, caring is focused on human interactions, but the trajectory of post-humanism is inexorably underway and suggests a broader embrace, embrace of non-human others. Rather than being stuck with the semantic narrative of dementia as a deteriorating and finally terminal condition, we might welcome the extent to which the possibilities of transformation or augmentation enhance a different kind of flourishing, whether human or otherwise. As we engage with post-humanism, the productive entanglements between human, animal, and here robotic corporealities switch attention from being to becoming. In opening up the parameters of the augmented self, dementia signals not an end to life, but a release from the rigidity of the sovereign self and an affirmation of continued being, sorry, continued becoming. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, I'm just typing a quick note into the chat to say, please feel free to put questions here. So you can also feel free to use the raise hand button if you have a question. Um, I have an introductory question, I guess, while we're waiting to see what other people think. Um, so I'm interested in what you have to say about this notion of, of empathy and empathy robots, right? Because it's a term that you use. There are a couple of different terms that are used to refer to these robots. I mean, like you say, we've got, you know, the companion robot. Mm. Um, so I'm curious where the term empathy comes from here, and if it's a concept that you've specifically kind of chosen as opposed to a different one, because you talk about, you know, empathy, sympathy, cuteness, relatability. Yeah. Um, so I where does the I, term come from? Yeah. How does it relate? I think all of those things, and I, I think really what, what I want to stress here is that it's an affective relation. It isn't just a utilitarian relation, it's going much further than that. And that it has a psychic value 
as opposed to simply an external value. It's not something that keeps you fit by organizing exercise classes. So for example, um, Papero and Pepper are very good at you know, sitting in front of a group of residents and raising their arms and saying, move your head to that side, move your head to that side. They're very good at it, um, but there's nothing effective, effective about it. So when I talk about empathy robots, it's really to try and establish that relation with a psychic dimension of what it is that the human being is supposed to lack, but in fact doesn't lack at all. So touch becomes a hugely important aspect of that. And virtually all of the studies, they're not really interested in touch, but they all demonstrate that touch is where it really works the best. So is that a, is that a term then that you're kind of advocating or problematizing or both? Um, I'm, I think, I think I'm um, certainly advocating it, but also with some degree of problematization, because the way in which empathy robots is, is used in the literature, insofar as it is at all, is again as a very utilitarian thing. So it, it has its own history, if you like. Um, I would like to say that empathy is much more than the people who are talking about empathy robots would understand by it. And dementia care in particular, um, it lags behind disability um, theory, if you like. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm very much steeped in disability stuff, but dementia care lags a long way behind. So the kind of critique that you would get in um, disability theory about going beyond the human no longer seems so particularly odd. Whereas in dementia care, the most radical people are still talking about human dignity and human rights. And as I said, that's important, but it really doesn't grasp the fact that if you are dealing with severe neurocognitive disease, that may not be the most appropriate thing to focus on. Thanks. Um, we have a question in the chat from Annabelle, uh, who says, hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a question about the Agnes suit developed by MIT, a suit that mimics the physical impact of aging. And there's a link in the chat um, if you're able to access that. And the implications that this has for empathy and differing embodied experiences. Oh, well, I know absolutely nothing about this. So the Agnes suit, I'll have to, I'll have, to have a quick look at the Agnes suit. Uh, page not found. That link isn't working, unfortunately. I mean, when you were developing this research, you must have kind of, you probably look at all sorts of different kinds of robots and you must have looked at different kinds of kind of robots that have relationships with, uh, with dementia patients in this case as well. I mean, do you have any thoughts about, can you say anything more about the production processes and implications of these? It's often like with care robots, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a, I mean, you know, said, just, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, what I said at the start is um, there are there are usually thought to be kind of four types of robots used in care. Um, so the um, service robots are there to really help staff um, with things like lifting, for example. Um, rehabilitation is much more encouraging people to do certain exercises to, you know, keep um, their functions going, if you like. Telepresence robots <laughs> are the ones that report back on you. They, they have a job of surveillance and they are um, tuned in very much to picking up any kind of change in things like blood pressure, heart rate, and so on. Um, in a sense, um, I mean, of course, you could do a huge Foucauldian um, critique of what's going on there but I'm not saying they don't serve an important function. But those three classes of robots, which are, which are the, the, um, the therapeutic robots and the service robots and the, the, the telepresence ones um, are probably the main robots that you would see in dementia care. And the ones that I'm looking at, which are the care robots, the, um, the empathy robots are a much, much smaller subset and much more recently involved. And 
what is absolutely striking, um, I put up a slide earlier about it, is the way in which there is almost universal agreement among, um, among dementia scholars that it matters that the robot appears to be humanoid, that that would be much, much more successful than a, a robot that isn't humanoid. And yet the, the studies themselves don't show that. They show something quite different. Um, they show that touch is incredibly important. Um, they show that it, any kind of display of vulnerability is important. Now, if you read papers on what makes robots useful, how they facilitate meetings, for example, they always say, make the robot have some vulnerable trait. You know, it stumbles over words or it doesn't quite understand some concept or whatever. And people then respond because they can see the vulnerability and think, oh, it's just like me, it's vulnerable. But that's something that relies only on the people who are using it being able to understand language and use language. And the problem, the absolute problem with people with moderate and certainly severe dementia is that language goes, hearing goes. So what you have left in most people is, is a sense of touch still. Um, I mean, that too may go, but it, it, it usually lasts much longer. So actually, the whole emphasis on robots being able to create group interaction is not going to work. Um, robots that use verbal instructions to encourage people to do things is not going to work. Now, when you see pictures of robots leading exercise classes, for example, these are not the people with moderate or severe dementia. These are usually people with mild symptoms who can still follow those instructions and hear. Um, so it's a very limited way of looking at what's possible. But for me, the, the emphasis on talking about empathy is to say you can go much further. Empathy does not have to rely on language. Um, it doesn't have to rely on either hearing language or being able to use language. And that seems to me to fit more generally with what care home residents may need. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, from what I understand, we actually have the link working now. So I think okay, uh, we're going to share the screen quickly. If anyone has a question in the meantime, please just raise your hand and we can follow up with you in just a second. That's coming up now. Uh, wait a sec. I, I don't know why I cannot share it on my screen, unfortunately. Um, I, th I think you can bring it up independently. Um, I will try. But look, the, uh, wait a sec. I sent it again in the chat because the link is working. Wait a sec. Mm. Um, perhaps directed to Margaret. I think yes. if you Google this, it should work, Margaret. Right. Yeah, I've seen it. Yes, it worked for me. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so um, I have a very, very quick reaction to, I don't know who it is who, who posed that particular question. The quick Annabelle, reaction. Annabelle, yeah. Annabelle, right. It makes me, um, it makes me feel as I feel when people say, Ooh, I'll spend a day in a wheelchair and then I'll know what it's like to be disabled. Um, I mean, this is obviously a much, much more sophisticated way of trying to create empathy um, by sp spending time in the Agnes suit. But I mean, I really hate those things because they always seem to fall short and they give, give users the impression that now they understand it. So you spend a day with your eyes masked and you think you know what it's like to be blind. You spend a day in a wheelchair. Well, those are very, very um, limited experiences. Um, if you contextualize a life, it isn't one day. It isn't just a few hours not feeling this or feeling that. 
it's the whole way in which a society treats you, understands you, the kind of reactions that you can expect from care staff, from your own family, from other residents. All of that gets kind of pushed away because here I am in my Agnes suit and now I've got some understanding. And maybe there is some understanding, but it feels wildly inadequate. Um, Annabelle, what did you think? Oh, she has the same reaction, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's the limits yeah. of empathy in this case, you know, failing empathy machine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so we have a question from Sophia in the chat and then um, I have a follow-up one on economics if we have time and I'm sure there'll be more questions in the meantime. So we'll okay. see. But Sophia asks, so why do you think dementia care is so out of touch with disability theory or what is it about dementia that tests the limits of critical disability studies? Um, I, I think because um, generally speaking, what has happened in disability theory is that many people with disabilities have been self-advocates for many years now. Um, there is a very, very strong movement within what I'm um, tentatively calling disability communities because you know that doesn't really sum it up at all, where people can advocate for themselves. And there is this strong sense of coming together and saying, these are the things we need, these are the things we feel, these are the things we actually want. Um, I think that's probably harder um, for people who have already lost the functionality of language in particular. Um, we are so reliant on language that it's, it's harder. But over and above that, there is such a taboo about aging. There is a complete taboo about aging itself, which I think, you know, there has certainly been a taboo about disability in our societies for centuries. Um, but I think certainly within feminist scholarship, there has been a very, very strong movement to go beyond that and to actually think about it in a very different kind of way in terms of differential embodiment and not hierarchical embodiment. I'm not sure that has actually happened in the same degree um, about dementia studies. And to be absolutely honest, um, I would say in the interest in um, gerontology in general within feminism has been exceptionally low until the last few years. And of course, the original feminists are getting to an age where they have to start thinking quite seriously, this will likely happen to me. Um, this will be my life, therefore I need to start thinking about it. Um, and I feel that quite strongly, um, that there has been at least the beginnings of an interest that simply wasn't there. Um, the, field, the field of dementia studies has, has not been a radical field at all, so that people who are advocating, and they're usually external, and they're not people with dementia, generally speaking, they're people who work with people with dementia or simply theorise, that the, the, the strongest um, appeal has been for human rights and dignity. That's been the strongest appeal, and that's considered radical. Um, which kind of indicates how far behind um, those, those studies are in terms of the kind of theorization that has gone on, certainly in postmodernist terms and now in posthumanist terms. Thank you. Julia, did you want to follow up with your question? Because I think it ties actually quite nicely onto this. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, it's just uh, my question, just following up to the Agnes suit. Um, I mean, given that <laughs> devices such those, um, as uh, Annabelle said, and, and you as well, Margaret, they fake age, they fake uh, what we might call disability and do not create really empathy between mm. humans and non-humans. I was wondering perhaps if there, there is a space to reflect about, upon dignity and human rights. Like, mm -hmm. uh, what I mean is like what um, 
I, I, I'm totally with you and Annabelle that devices such prosthetics like those, they really irritate me. And I also would say, like you said, I hate them. But what makes me feel angry and hating them is that I, I feel like it comes a um, an attack on the dignity and the rights of people who you might call disabled. Precisely in this faking and experience, mm. Mm. It, this faking is... Um, undignified thinking of the people yeah. who experience that in their yeah. own bodies. So per perhaps there is a space to think about ethics and, uh, and dignity and human rights. Um, yeah, I, I mean, having just clicked on the website very briefly right now, I'm obviously just talking off the top of my head, but it, I would agree with you. It does, it does seem a very um, demeaning way of trying to understand somebody else's experience. Um, I think anything that pretends to be what it is not is saying in a way, um, well, we can be just like you, we'll take on a few of those facets and we'll be just like you. And of course it's nothing like that. Um, I, I suspect the Agnes suit doesn't convey pain, for example, in, in the way that people may be feeling it. Um, any, any kind of um, mimicking seems in itself, I don't know, to, dim, to, to diminish the people it mimics. Mm. Um, I, I have a quite strong visceral reaction against it. Um, I'd like, I mean, I've written it down, so I'm going, I'm going to look it up after we've finished. I'll have a really good look at it because I hadn't heard of it before. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's an interesting thing, but I can't see where that would be used or how widely it could be used. Um, you know, these things cost lots of money. Who's going to use it? Yeah. No. Mm. I mean, you know, I, I, I told you that, you know, the, the, the para robot, which seems to be one of the most successful ones in, in terms of empathy robots, is $6,000. So immediately, you know, there's a very, very limited way that that can be used. So any kind of robotic technology, you know, they're, they're, they're very expensive things. And what difference is it going to make if a handful of, you know, privileged people get to think, oh, I know what it's like, even though they won't. So yeah, I have a very negative reaction to it. Thank you. Does anyone have a last question? Okay, in that case, I'm going to go ahead and just ask a quick one about the, the economics of this, right? So because I see, for instance, on this website, not to pick on Age Lab, but they have another device called Miss Daisy, which is a high fidelity um, driving simulator. So there's all these kinds of issues of class and race as well that come up. And obviously money um, is also yeah. bound up in these discussions. So when you were talking about, you know, the $6,000 cost of, um, of Paro, Arrow, yeah, but then that this also maybe offsets the cost of pharmaceuticals and maybe offsets the cost of personnel at places where staffing is already often a problem. So are these discourses that also get deployed? You know, is there a sense in which you know these robots are taking taking people's jobs, or is no you know is no one really concerned about? Oh yeah, I mean that's room? that's um, been voiced. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> always taking people's jobs, um, but the the real issue here is. Um, of course, there may be savings in costs and pharmaceuticals might be one of them. Um, you might possibly be able to have less human staff, who knows. But this already assumes that you have a structure in which those things can be diminished. If you're looking at dementia worldwide and when the WHO quotes, and this, this is um, last year's figures, 50 million people worldwide. It's something like 65, 70% of those people are in impoverished areas. So there isn't a structure. Um, there probably aren't care homes for many people. Well, there won't be care homes for many people for clear. Um, so the, the whole idea of the economics of it is, it's a Western discourse. It's a Western question that, you know, we can think, how is it that Danish care homes, 80% of Danish care homes are using Paro? Well, 
I'm sure somebody sat down and worked out the economics of, in the end, this is the better way of doing it, rather than thinking, does this enhance people's ability to have pleasure? I'm sure it's an economic decision in the end, um, but it could only happen in somewhere like Denmark. It's not going to happen in Indonesia, for example. Um, I mean, the, the interesting thing, of course, and I, I scarcely touched on it, is, is the different way in which dementia is seen in um, particularly Southeast Asian countries where family has a, has a different meaning, that the family relationship is already, if you like, some kind of assemblage. And the individual doesn't have this supreme value where their agency counts only for themselves. It's agency within a family setting. So that families are much more likely to encompass somebody with um, dementia as a matter of course, as long as they're somehow still within that family assemblage. And what is feared is not the loss of independence or the loss of agency. What's feared is the loss of interrelationship. It's a very, very different way of looking at it. Um, Japan, of course, is now um, experiencing huge numbers, um, disproportionate numbers of older people and many, many more care institutions have opened quite recently. It used to be a family issue and now it's become an institutional issue. And I, I'm, I'm unclear how it plays out in terms of institutions as opposed to families, but there's certainly a difference about how you value individual autonomy and it, it's, it's a completely non-Western model. Thank you for that and also for taking what could have kind of been a grim question to end on and you know turning it so you know so we can see the positive light um, as well. Uh, I guess that is as good a place as any to wrap up. I mean again thank you for this discussion. I'm definitely going to go away and think about touch um, non living assemblage. Um, and yeah this idea of dementia is sustained becoming. Um, is also a really a really beautiful one, I think. So yeah, thank you again for the talk. Um, well, thank I don't know, you, if, did the organizers want to say anything final as well? Yeah, just a quick reminder, the next lecture will be on Friday, I mean, in two days, and it will not be at 5 p.m. Berlin time as today, but at 6 p.m. as usual. Yeah, and thank you all for coming. Okay, well, I, I would just like to thank the organizers too, and you, Megan, because um, you know it's it's been a really nice experience. And thank you for the questions, and I'm delighted to find out about the Agnes suit. <laughs> <laughs> We're all okay, going to go bye away. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks, bye. Everybody. Thanks, Margaret. Bye. I wanted to check where the recordings are available. Is that just on the... Not yet, but okay. we will put it online very soon. Because I have a couple of PhD students who couldn't make it, but would definitely have been interested in the discussion. So. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we will, um, we will do very soon. Thank Amazing. you very yeah, much. Thank you sharing. so much for putting this together. It's, uh, it's great. And I'm hoping to make it to a few talks next week um, as well. Right. Cool. Good night. So, hey, I... Uh, so, no, I, I want to say that I really, really, really like a lot your talk. Thanks. And the reason why I enjoyed it so much, I wrote to the email, you, you got it, right? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah it's because there were um, so incredible cross readings with classics. Right, you said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were... I right. mean, uh, the, the one question obviously was, uh, was put as a question, or already the name of 